My most recent three sermons have focused on anxiety and depression, both in the body and the soul. And the reason for doing this was twofold, as I mentioned early on. First, we, as pastors, we know that many of you struggle with these things. And we also know that parents and children often clash in discussing these things and that the world around us talks about them a great deal. So that was one of the prompts. And the other prompt was our study in 1 Peter chapter 3, where in verse 15, the Apostle Peter reminds us about the hope that is in us. And anxiety and depression seem so opposite to hope. And in many ways, they are. Christians have a hope in them, and this hope is part of the remedy or the solution for anxiety and depression. But we often lose our enjoyment of that hope or our testimony of that hope when we fall into sinful anxiety or sinful depression. So we've been addressing this in the past three sermons, and the original plan was to talk about 12 traps to avoid with relation to uh, anxiety and depression. And that's become 32... No, just kidding. (laughs) We've been moving through the original 12, and this sermon comes to the 12th. We've looked at 11 already, and this sermon will be dedicated to that 12th. Let me just list them for you, review them for you, And then we'll move into the 12th, which is the focus of this sermon. So the the 11 that we've looked at so far, traps which we ought to avoid, were unintentional atheism, unused means, unjustified excuses, unrealistic exaggerations, unguided children, unfriendly friends, unending misery, unnecessary self-evaluation, unacknowledged discontentment, unresolved conflict, and unconfessed sin. Those were the first 11. And the 12th, which this sermon is dedicated to, is unprocessed sadness. Unprocessed sadness. As I thought about these sermons, even before they were written and and preached, I have become more and more convinced personally that one one of the major causes of anxiety and depression in our day and in our culture, in both body and soul is what we might call unprocessed sadness. Now, what do the scriptures teach us about sadness? What does the Bible say? What does God's word say about sadness and how we should think about it and respond to it? You may find this sermon very surprising. The overall heading or the title of the sermon is Unprocessed Sadness, but we're going to move through that in six points. So the sermon title, I guess you could say, is Unprocessed Sadness. And we're going to have six points dealing with this. Point number one. Don't mask sadness with humor or avoid it with entertainment. Don't mask sadness with humor or avoid it with entertainment. One of the things that is very common in our culture, in our time, is an avoidance of sadness, a very intentional avoidance of dealing with things that make us sad. And one of the ways in which people do this is by masking their sadness with humor. If you're always happy and laughing you never have to be sad. Or at least no one will know that you are sad. Because if everything's a joke, then nothing's serious. But turn with me to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. And look at verse 13. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 13. It says, Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. Even in laughter, the heart may ache. So even when there's an outward appearance, a mask, even when there's an outward appearance of laughter and joking, 
It may be concealing and hiding an aching heart. And so those people who constantly put on an outward appearance of laughter and joking, it may simply lead them on to perpetual grief because they are containing and holding back an aching heart. Another way to put this is to say that laughter doesn't cure sadness. Laughter doesn't cure sadness, and in fact, it may just make it worse by masking it or hiding and concealing it. You're presenting a complete opposite face to your heart. The heart is aching while the face is laughing. That will induce a mania, a madness, really, of complete, of polar opposite emotions. And there are many people who have a deep inner sadness or depression who then remain in it in part because they refuse to look at that sadness or even consider it. And they use humor and joking as a way to keep others from knowing about it or helping them to deal with it. And this reminds me of a a funny video that my wife showed me recently about a little girl eating food. And the parents or whoever it was were asking the little girl, do you like it? Is it good? And she was saying, "Uh uh-huh, yeah. And then she was gagging and vomiting. So she was saying, yes, I like it. But in reality, she despised the food. And her, her little girl emotions were swinging from one end to the other of, yes, smiling, I do like it. And then nearly gagging and vomiting her food. And so also, how are you? Oh, I'm so good when the heart is actually aching. She should have said, no, I don't like it. Please take it away. And so also, if we refuse to acknowledge our sadness, we just mask it with humor, it can be one of the causes of remaining in depression and remaining in sadness. We need to remember that even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. Another way in which people avoid sadness is by distracting themselves with amusement and entertainment. The one who uses a mask of sadness is actively keeping it away. But the one who avoids sadness with entertainment is using something else as a distraction from their own difficulties. Now, of course, entertainment and amusement are not bad in themselves in moderation, but we need to recognize in our day and age one of the dangers or the downsides of our technology. Think about this with me. For most of the history of the world, if you wanted to hear a song what would you have to do? You'd have to find a musician who had an instrument and knew how to play it. Maybe you could sing it yourself, but you may not even know a song. (laughs) And if you wanted to hear a song, you'd have to go to some kind of performance from a musician with a musical instrument. And apart from that, music wouldn't be in your life. And so when you finally heard a, a, a a harp or a stringed instrument or a violin or a flute or something like that, it would sound so beautiful and otherworldly because it was so rare and it was so difficult to hear those things. But now we have instant access to every possible song you could ever want to listen to. And so we ha- having this great access, which is a, a blessing, one of the ways in which we at times misuse it is we... we overpower our senses with a constant bombardment of distraction through things like music or other media so that we don't have to think about sadness or difficulty. And of course, it's not just music. It's also uh, movies and binge-watching shows and all kinds of entertainment that engages the eyes also, where we, get, we can watch whatever we want. In the past, if you wanted to see a performance of something, you would need to wait for a traveling group of artists who would come through and put on a play in your town or something or go to the town hall for a performance or some other kind of organized event. It, someone had to do it and you had to go see it in order for you to be entertained and amused. But, but now everything is in our phones and in our ears and in our eyes instantly. That's not always a bad thing. It's, it can be very pleasant at times. Here's the, what's the point? Is the point entertainment bad? No, the point is Are we perhaps distracting ourselves from facing the sadnesses and the realities and the harshness of our lives? Even in laughter, the heart may ache. You can distract yourself 
all you want. It doesn't change the pain. It doesn't change the heartache. It doesn't change the harsh realities of life that you are facing or perhaps have experienced in your past. So unprocessed sadness happens when we mask our sadness with humor. Everything's a joke. Nothing's ever serious. Or when we distract ourselves, amuse ourselves by using various forms of endless entertainment and distraction. We need to realize, maybe I'm keeping it away. Maybe I'm refusing to deal with it. Well, secondly, in the second place, weep with those who weep. Weep with those who weep. Point one is kind of telling people who are dealing with grief and sadness, you you need to look at it. You need to face it. But what about those who are helping others dealing with sadness? How should we respond to others who are in a, a, a deep well of sadness? What do we do? How do we help them as a church community, as a family, as a spouse? How do we help those who are, who are deeply sad? Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, he says, weep with those who weep. But wait, Paul, you said elsewhere, rejoice always. So I should tell those who weep, hey, stop weeping, rejoice always. No, Paul says, weep with those who weep. We ought to show sympathy and compassion for those who are enduring sadness. You may think, no, 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 we need to move them out of their sadness. Hey, come on, cheer up. And yes, there are times where there are illegitimate causes of sadness. People do not have a good reason to be sad, and we do need to exhort or confront sinful emotions. But we're not talking about those. We're talking about true causes of grief and mourning and sadness. You, don't, you shouldn't try to move that person out of their sadness, not necessarily, at least not immediately. If they have a reason to grieve or a reason to weep, don't hinder them, help them. Be with them in their grief and walk with them through that valley. Weep with those who weep. This may sound strange to you, but if they have a legitimate reason to be sad, then it's okay for them to be sad, and you shouldn't try to change that. It's not sinful to be sad at that which is sinful or because of that which is sinful. Turn with me. To Proverbs 25. Look at verse 20. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. So we have two examples to illustrate the point. One is taking off a garment on a cold day. What helps someone who's cold? Warm clothing. So the opposite of helping someone who's cold is taking off their coat, taking off their garments. You'd say that's not what they need. They need the garments. Vinegar on Soda. I had to look up what this means because I didn't know what it means. And soap and vinegar, if you mix certain ones, they cancel out their chemical effects. They become useless. If you put vinegar onto certain kinds of soaps, it's no, it no longer will accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. It's, it's the worst thing you could do because it does the opposite. Instead of making someone warm, you make them cold. Instead of creating an efficient cleaning agent, you've destroyed the cleaning agent. It will no longer clean. This won't get them warm. This won't get it clean. And so also singing songs to a heavy heart won't make them happy. Just cheer up. Just cheer up. Just cheer up. Come on. Come on. Let's watch a funny movie. Let's do something silly. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. Again, yes, there are illegitimate causes for sadness. You'd say to your young child, why are you crying? Daddy said I can only have two cookies. 
you'd say, okay, get over it. <laughs> but for the legitimate causes of sadness and mourning and grief, what that person needs is not a happy song. They have an aching heart, and they need someone to weep with them. Weep with those who weep, the Apostle Paul says. Trying to cheer them up with jokes and laughter may just make a bad situation worse. In the previous point, we said that those who, who grieve shouldn't mask or avoid their grief. In this point, we're telling other people, don't do the same thing to them. So how do we help brothers and sisters in Christ who are grieving? We weep with those who weep. We are with them in their time of need. We are a comforting presence. But we shouldn't sing happy songs to a heavy heart. Thirdly, Sorrow soothes souls. Sorrow soothes souls. At this point, you may be very confused. You may be thinking, I thought that these sermons are about helping people out of their depression. And it seems like you're saying, hey, just be depressed. Or hey, it's okay to be sad and just... Just be sad. And others shouldn't try to move you out of that. They should just be sad with you. How is this helpful? What in the world is going on? How is, isn't this encouraging some perpetual pity party? Oh, poor me. Oh, poor me. Woe is me. Woe is me. Well, no. As we've already said, and we'll say again, there are sinful emotions that need to be rebuked as sin. Think about Jonah. Two times, Jonah's grumbling and complaining. He's upset. He's angry. And God says to him, do you do well to be angry? And pity parties and woe is me. Yes, we need to say to that person, do you do well to be miserable and sad? Do you do well to be angry? There is bitterness. There is resentment. There is discontentment. We've talked about those and other traps. And those things should be rebuked and avoided. We're not talking about those. What we're talking about is a kind of sadness that is moderate and purposeful. A sadness that is moderate and purposeful. We need to realize that there is a moderate and purposeful sadness that soothes the soul, such that it is specifically by passing through that sadness that you get out of the sadness. By experiencing grief, we pass through grief and arrive at joy. So we are not condoning or encouraging perpetual sadness and misery. We are encouraging and indeed uh, promoting people to face legitimate causes of grief, to grieve them that going through it, they might get out of it. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. If you're still in Proverbs, it's the next book over. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. The trap that many fall into is thinking that they must avoid their sadness to overcome their sadness. That's not true. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter. Why? We have a, a statement and then an explanation. For, because, this is the reason why sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. So no, we are not promoting a perpetual sadness. We are promoting a moderate and purposeful sadness for good reason, which does lead to a glad heart. Who in the world would think that sorrow is better than laughter? The one who realizes that sorrow soothes the soul and leads to gladness. You see, when one is sad and uses laughter to mask it or avoid it, the laughter is worse than sorrow. It just makes things worse. 
And if others use laughter to try to cure heaviness of heart, they're not helping. And that's because humor and songs and entertainment are artificial happiness. They're an external artificial happiness. Jokes and entertainment and all those things, they're fine in and of themselves, but they're just artificial joy. That's why they can never cure the heart. What can cure the heart? Sorrow soothes the soul. By sadness of face, the heart is made glad. As strange as it may sound, purposeful and moderate sadness cures sadness. It's not strange at all, though. By sadness of face, the heart is made glad. Those who mourn and grieve and do not hide from their sadness, they are rehabilitated and refreshed. In the same way, in the same way that staying awake does not cure sleepiness, sleep does. So also laughter does not cure a sad soul, sadness does. You see, you think, oh, I'm really tired, what should I do? Stay awake? Because that's the opposite of tiredness? No, you need to sleep in order to not be tired. Not force yourself into insomnia so that you're not tired. You see that that nonsense, it doesn't make sense. So also... I'm sad. I need to generate an opposite emotion to that. I'm going to use artificial joy, laughter, humor, distraction, all these things. It doesn't actually work. Sadness cures sadness. Sorrow soothes souls. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you to consider the sources of sorrow in your life. And putting away all discontentment as a sin putting away bitterness or anger as sins, giving them no place, putting away self-centeredness as a sin, putting away excuses as sins, putting those illegitimate causes of sadness or anger or distress as not to be allowed, putting those things away, consider the crosses and losses in your life, and you may grieve them not with a self-centered or endless pity party, but with a moderate and purposeful grief because sorrow soothes souls. What happens if we don't? Let's turn back to Proverbs, Proverbs 18. What happens if we don't pass through the sadness in order to arrive at joy? We will live with a crushed spirit. Proverbs 18, verse 14. A man's spirit will endure sickness. So let's pause. You have a sick body with an encouraged heart. Man can handle that. But then it says, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? When your body is wasting away, the heart can remain strong. But when the heart is weak and crushed, who who can bear that? Who can endure it? Who, Who can live that way? We need to have our souls healed. We need to arrive at joy. But what we need to understand is one of the ways in which we accomplish that is by passing through sadness and experiencing sadness on the way to joy. But many view sadness as a a deep as a lake. They see a pool of water and they think, this is not a pool, this is a deep, bottomless well of sadness and I don't want to get in that water. I don't want to get in the pool of sadness because it has no bottom. I will sink and I will sink and I will sink and I will never get out. Or they think of sadness like a door and behind that door is just an endless path of sadness. I don't want to open that door because it's just endless sadness. It's Sadness without a bottom or sadness without an end. I don't want to get in that pool. I don't want to walk through that door. But we need to realize that the way out is the way through. And then we realize when we step into the pool of sadness, it's not an abyss. It's a spa. And it does heal. And when we open the door of sorrow, it's not a prison, but a garden behind the door. The way out 
is the way through. Who can endure a crushed soul? Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. But if you will never get into that pool of sadness, which is truly a spa, and if you will never open the door of sadness, which is truly a garden, then you will never emerge. You will never get through. You will never overcome. You will never get beyond that crushed heart and crushed spirit. This leads us to the fourth point. Number four, learn to lament. Learn to lament. Part of processing sadness is expressing it. And it's not my purpose or my place to micromanage the grief of any one of you. But the scriptures give us a clear model of how to face and endure and express our sadness. And we find that model in the many lamentations in the scriptures, especially the Psalms of lament. So turn with me to Psalm 13. Psalm 13. The Psalms of Lament teach us to lament in a godly way. We do not challenge God. We do not defy God. We do not accuse God. But we do express ourselves to him. We express our fears. We express our doubts. We express our griefs. We confess our sins. We cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And we ask him for help. And we ask him for mercy. We give voice to our petitions. And we also express our trust in God. Let's read Psalm 13, which there are many examples, but I chose this one because it's a short, a short example. Psalm 13 How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Psalm 13 is one example of many. Does the psalmist have a problem-free life at the end of the psalm? No, but he is trusting in the Lord. He gives voice to his sorrows. He expresses his lamentation. He asks, how long, O Lord, not to challenge, not to defy, not to accuse, but to appeal and say, O Lord, please have mercy. O Lord, hear me. O Lord, help me. I have sorrow in my heart all the day. But does he remain in perpetual sorrow and misery? No, he says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. You see, this sermon begins the transition from talking about the problems to talking about the remedies, the solutions. This sermon is a hinge. It begins that transition from anxiety and depression to hope. Because this sermon shows us that overcoming anxiety and depression is in part achieved by realizing that we shouldn't be trying to eradicate sadness from every part and parcel of our lives. If that's the way that you're trying to handle anxiety and depression is by removing all sadness from your life, then you're going to live in a denial of reality. You're going to be by, like that little girl. Do you like the food? Uh-huh. All the while, 
you want to gag and vomit. Even in laughter, the heart may ache. We should learn to live with sadness as part of the natural emotions that God gave us, which respond to real tragedy and trauma in this life. That may be something you've never heard before. Learn to live with sadness? Yes, a moderate and purposeful sadness. We should not mask it. We should not avoid it. We should pass through it so that God may bring us to joy on the other side. Sorrow soothes souls, and the Psalms of Lament give us a model from which we can learn how to give voice and how to express ourselves to God and to others as we face and endure and process our sadness. When you're a little child and your parents let you taste something like like wine, to have a taste of it. The child says, oh, no, oh. Whereas the adult says, I've learned to enjoy this, and it is good, and it is sweet. So also, you may be like that with sadness. Your initial taste of sadness may be, oh, no, I don't want that. But then you learn its benefits. You learn that the point is not to remain sad. The point is not to live in perpetual self-pity. The point is not endless misery. The point is to pass through sadness unto joy. When you first step in that spa, you say, ooh, the water's hot. But those waters heal. And brothers and sisters, the scriptures give us another model, which brings us to the fifth point. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. In Isaiah chapter 53, we are told about our beloved God, Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 3 of Isaiah 53, He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then in the very next verse it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He knows. He understands, not just with divine omniscience, but with human personal experience. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says that Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Brothers and sisters, Jesus knows the sorrows and the griefs of this life, and he knows the sorrows and the griefs of your life. And surely he has borne them and carried them. Jesus is God in the flesh, and he wept when Lazarus died. And he wept over Jerusalem that would not hear him and be gathered to him. And Jesus had compassion on the crowds. He was kind to all and gentle to the feeble and caring to the weak. So I will not hide from my grief or mask my sorrow because Jesus wept too. And I want to be like him. He was sad, but he was not overcome by sadness. He mourned, but he was not defeated by mourning. I want to be like him with a moderate and purposeful grief. And when I see the pool of sadness or the door of grief, I will not be afraid to enter because I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Jesus, my great high priest, is with me. And he is able to sympathize with my weaknesses. And he has given to me his comforter his Holy Spirit as a reminder and a guarantee of his presence with me. He wept, and we may weep. He mourned, and we may mourn. He overcame, and we can overcome in him. You're not alone in your sorrow. You're not alone in your grief. And your God understands. 
your high priest sympathizes. Speak to him. Give voice to your prayers and to your feelings and to your griefs. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but never overcome, never overpowered, never defeated by it. But rather he prevailed in every way, and in him so may we. This brings us to our sixth and final point. The first day of the week. The first day of the week. It's my intention next week to give you four remedies. Four remedies for anxiety and depression. But I want you to consider this one for now, the first day of the week. And I I would like you to please turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We just read this morning, a few minutes ago, from the Gospel of Mark about Jesus' burial and that Mary Magdalene knew, she saw where he was buried, which helps us to pick up the reading in John chapter 20. How can we deal with sadness? We see in John 20, verses 1 and following. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb both of them running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, And he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, Why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary Magdalene wept. She was weeping. What was it that brought her weeping to an end? To know that her Lord lived. And her tears of grief no doubt turned to tears of joy in a moment as she saw Jesus and embraced him. And then he says, do not cling to me, because surely she was, she was embracing him. My Lord, my teacher. And no doubt she continued to, to cry, but no longer weeping. Tears of rejoicing, tears of joy, Jesus rose on the first day of the week, and he has given his church the first day of the week as a regular reminder of his resurrection and a refreshment for our souls, because we are his bride. And he says to us, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? You see, there is a joy that overpowers sadness. There is a light that overpowers darkness. 
There is a medicine that overpowers sickness. There is a strength that overpowers weakness. There is a life that overpowers death. There is one who turns our tears of grief into tears of joy. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he is risen from the dead. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? He is risen from the dead. And so, brothers and sisters, when we pass through sadness, it is knowing that there is an end knowing that it does not last forever, knowing that these tears of grief become tears of joy in and through Jesus Christ. And it is he who heals us, the man of sorrows. It is he who helps us, the one acquainted with grief. And he asks us, he says, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And he gave us the first day of the week so that he would regularly remind us there is an end. There is an end. I have put an end to all of this. I have risen from the dead. Look to me. Look to my light. Look to my life and have joy in me that overpowers and overcomes your sadness because I have overcome death itself. And in Jesus Christ, our tears do indeed transform from tears of grief to tears of joy. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you for your mercy to us in Christ Jesus. And we pray that you would help us to face the difficulties that you have permitted in our lives and to pass through them and to pass through the experience of them, and to pass through the sadness of them, that we might come through and and attain joy and gladness. We pray that you would help us to look to Jesus Christ, to set our eyes upon him, and to find our joy and our hope in him, and the end of all our sorrows. We pray this in his name, in Jesus' name. Amen.